I now call to order the Society's 2,503rd meeting in what is now the 153rd year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's PSW meeting and the lecture by Alexandra Gade. The Society is grateful to PSW Full Year Series sponsors, PSW member Mike Helton and Helton Associates LLC for their support. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> if you want to give personal thanks to Mike, he's here but won't be here the whole evening, so. And to a PSW member who wishes to remain anonymous, we'll thank him too. I'm pleased to note the following new members have been admitted to the society. Michael Haken, a physicist retired from the science and, tech science and technology, interested in physics, cosmology, the Origin of Life in Astrobiology, who learned of PSW some years ago, and more recently by Google search. And tonight's speaker, Alexandra Gade, who learned of PSW from the invitation to speak here tonight, and whose interests will be clear in some small part from tonight's lecture. If you are interested in membership, which you should be if you're not a member, you can access a membership application on the PSW website by clicking the blue join button on the home page at the upper right hand corner. And if you're here in the Powell Auditorium, you can use a QR code on the cards at the back of the room. Everyone with a genuine interest in science is welcome to become a member. All members are entitled to a signed copy of volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington and if you choose to purchase and wear the ribbon of the society. If you're a new member and you haven't received your copy of the bulletin, please see me after the lecture proceedings have been completed. Recording Secretary Scott Matthews will now present the minutes of the 2502nd meeting and the lecture by Mark Okrand on Klingon and other constructed languages in the real world. He will be reading in English Scott, the stage is yours. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good evening. On December 4th, 2024, members of the society and guests joined the speaker for a reception and dinner at 5.45 p.m. in the members dining room at the Cosmos Club. Thereafter, they joined other attendees in the Powell Auditorium for the lecture proceedings. In the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called the 2502nd meeting of the Society to order at 8.01 p.m. Eastern Time. He began by welcoming attendees, thanking sponsors for their support, and announcing new members. Scott Matthews then read the minutes of the previous meeting, which included the lecture by Kirby Runyon titled Space Tourism, Enabling a Spacefaring Civilization. The minutes were approved as read. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Mark Okrand. His lecture was titled, Klingon and Other Constructed Languages in the Real World. The speaker began by presenting a hoax, wherein it was claimed that the company Rosetta Stone had released a product to teach the Klingon language. Okrand said that the hoax worked because it was plausible. Klingon had grown from a few sentences made up for a film into a language spoken by many thousands of people at various degrees of fluency all over the world. He then presented some, some of the history of constructed languages, particularly with respect to science fiction on television and in movies. He said that in the early days of film and television, aliens almost always spoke English or the native language where the film was produced, or they just, quote, made stuff up, it was gobbledygook, unquote. That gobbledygook was based on the phonetics and syllables of real human languages. Okren referred to these as fake languages, indicating that they had no structure or grammar, just sounds. Klingon, he said, has all the elements and characteristics of a natural language and is therefore a, quote, constructed language or conlang. 
The speaker gave examples of several conlangs created for a variety of reasons throughout history. These included lingua ignota, created by Hildegard von Bingen, a 12th century German nun, a philosophical language developed by John Wilkins, one of the founders of the Royal Society in the 16th century, and perhaps the most well-known conlang, Esperanto, created in the 19th century by Ludwig Zamenhof. He then discussed conlangs created for research purposes, constructed languages used by linguists and brain scientists to study various aspects of communication and learning. He mentioned the fictional languages created by J.R.R. Tolkien in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Okrand argued that Hebrew, that modern Hebrew, can be considered a conlang by virtue of the fact that it was revived and subsequently codified by Eliezer ben Huda in the late 19th century. The speaker then described a number of fictional but properly constructed languages made for television and movies. These included The Land of the Lost, The Quest for Fire, Disney's Atlantis, the Navi language of Avatar, and Klingon, first constructed for the movie Star Trek III. Okran discussed the fact that he deliberately tried to make Klingon a non-human language, using not only uncommon sounds, but also changing the word order, using object, verb, subject, instead of the more common word orders used in most human languages. He went on to discuss the ways in which the movie director's preferences and the mistakes made by the actors forced him to change both the vocabulary and the structure of Klingon. This evolution of the Klingon language has continued with the subsequent Star Trek television shows, Next Generation, Voyager, and Deep Space Nine. He gave a specific example of the Klingon honor sword, which is now known as the Batlath. Okran said that the producers and directors looked up the words honor and sword in the Klingon dictionary, but that a combination of typing errors and mispronunciation led to a word constructed from non-Klingon sounds. Once the word was used on screen, it was ipso facto, just as legitimate as any other Klingon utterance. He justified these changes by saying that all natural languages evolve over time. The speaker then addressed the growth of the Klingon language, which coincided with the publication of the first Klingon dictionary and the growth of the internet in the early 1990s. Okran said that during this period, significant numbers of people began to study and analyze the language and, quote, a whole new subculture formed, and a small segment of this subculture became absolutely fluent, end quote. They created the Klingon Language Institute and began publishing peer-reviewed journal papers. They organized annual conventions for Klingon speakers in cities around the world. Okran showed examples of several famous works of literature that have been translated and published in Klingon, including the works of Shakespeare. The speaker then discussed how new words are added to the Klingon language, largely motivated by Klingon speakers wanting to discuss ideas and objects found in the modern world which are not mentioned in Star Trek. He described how Klingon speakers created words for things like bicycles, pineapples, scarecrows, and the coronavirus. Okrand noted that the Klingon Language Institute recognizes him as the ultimate authority on the creation of new Klingon words. The speaker concluded his talk by saying that Guinness World Records has declared that Klingon is the world's largest fictional language. And although there is still no course on Rosetta Stone, you can learn Klingon on Duolingo. The lecture was followed by a question and answer session. A guest asked about the systematic efforts to expand the Klingon vocabulary. Okrand indicated that there has been much discussion within the Klingon speaking community about standardizing new vocabulary and the possible release of an updated Klingon dictionary, but that this was still in the works. He indicated that the biggest requests are for scientific vocabulary. A member asked how many words are in the Klingon language. Okrand responded that the original dictionary contained about 2,000 words but that about 4,000 to 5,000 words are now recognized. Unfortunately, this larger vocabulary is not currently available in a single printed source. A member asked if the speaker was impressed with the translation ability of chat GPT and other AIs. Okrand responded that he was impressed. 
He qualified this by saying that AI translations are not perfect, but that they are nonetheless impressive. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker and presented him with a PSW rosette, a signed copy of the announcement of his talk, and a signed copy of volume one of the PSW bulletin. He then announced speakers for upcoming lectures, made a number of housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. He adjourned the 2,502nd meeting of the society at 9.46 p.m. Eastern time. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 18.3 degrees Celsius. Weather, mostly cloudy. Audience in the Powell Auditorium, 61. Views of the video in the first two weeks, 427. Respectfully submitted, Scott Matthews, Recording Secretary. Well, I have to thank Scott for that extraordinarily succinct and accurate summation of the lecture by uh, Okrand on Klingon. Um, it was a lot of fun. He's an interesting guy. He's really a linguist. And uh, there actually are translations of Shakespeare into Klingon. In fact, you, you haven't really read Shakespeare until you've read it in the original Klingon. And we now turn to tonight's lecture by Alexander Gade on the science of rare isotopes from cosmological origin of the elements to making rare isotopes for use on Earth. Alexandra is professor of physics at the Michigan State University and director of the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, RIB, where she is responsible for ensuring that the facility fulfills its scientific promise. Her own research focuses on the structure of short-lived rare isotopes, primarily using gamma ray spectroscopy and nuclear reactions at FRIB. In addition to other service to the physics community and the nation, she has served on the Nuclear Science Advisory Committee to the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation, and on the writing group for the 2023 U.S. Nuclear Science Long Range Plan. She has also played a major role in assembling white papers on rare isotope research and instrumentation using FRIB. She's an author on more than 300 peer-reviewed publications. And among other honors and awards, she is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the AAAS, recipient of the Zemansky Prize, a DOE Outstanding Junior Investigator Award, and a Sloan Research Fellowship. She earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of Cologne in Germany, which are pretty much a MS, BS, MS, and PhD in US parlance. And I won't try and say what they are in ger German, which I think yeah, my German is very fractured. So as usual, all questions will be fielded in the Q&A session after the lecture. And without further ado, Alexandra, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this very humbling introduction and also um, for the invitation to, to speak here in front of this um, society and to, to see the beautiful Cosmos Club. And I'm very happy that you came and joined for this, for this lecture. So I want to take you on a journey that brings me from the origin of the elements in the universe to applications of rare isotopes for societal um, benefit or for national benefit, as, as you will see. So after this fantastic dinner, what I have on the menu for you for this um, lecture is, uh, first I will, I will tell you a little bit, what are rare isotopes to begin with? What, what is an isotope and when do we call it rare? And then I'll tell you a little bit about contemporary research, and that is the question for their limits of existence. Which combinations of protons and neutrons can be made into a nucleus to begin with? We don't know that after decades of research in nuclear science. Then I'll show you how we can study them and why they are important if we ever want to understand the origin of the elements in the universe or the power that creates explosive cosmic scenarios such as supernova or X-ray bursts. Okay, and then I'll dig digress a little and tell you about neutron stars, which are some of the most fascinating objects in the universe and um, their properties are governed by nuclear physics that we can access in the laboratory. 
And then I'll, I'll show you that um, this is not just of fundamental research interest, but where isotopes or their decays are actually put to use for societal and national benefit. And I'll give you um, some brief examples on that. So let me see. Um, so I already mentioned it that um, nuclei are made up of protons and neutrons, and they are really at the heart of atoms, okay? So, and if you take any textbook or Google or ChatGPT, what you will find is um, that a nucleus is always characterized by its element, um, and this can be C for carbon, it can be CA for calcium, and then it's characterized by its number of protons, which is Z down here, Okay, and that number is important because if you think about a neutral atom, that is also the number of electrons that this atom will assemble to become neutral, and that determines its chemistry, the, the configurations that these electrons take. So, and then we come to the interesting number of A, and A is the total mass of the nucleus, which is the sum of protons and neutrons. Okay, and this is how we get to isotopes. So each element, calcium, carbon, and I will talk a little bit about hydrogen, exists in different versions, and these versions are the isotopes. So their chemical properties are identical because, well, they have the same proton number and same, almost the identical, electron configuration. So how, how do we get to an isotope? I'm putting you here the most simple nucleus that exists, and that is the proton, which is at the heart of the hydrogen atom, okay? And 99.99% of all the hydrogen um, that you find on Earth is exactly that. It has one proton, and then the atom has an electron. So there is an isotope of hydrogen that exists that has one proton and one neutron, okay? And this is called deuteron, okay? And then it's written here, hydrogen 2. And then there's tritium, and that has two neutrons, okay? So the difference of the different isotopes is in the A, okay? Proton number is the same, but they, but they have different mass because they have a different number of neutrons. And it does not change the chemistry at all because we don't touch the electrons, okay? So, but they are completely different in the way that they react or that they um, shape how energy is produced in stars, okay? And so um, fewer than 300 isotopes um, that we find on Earth are actually stable. Um, and there are many thousand that we know about, and they are unstable and they decay via radioactivity. And um, those things is what we call rare isotopes. If, if I go and ask my theory colleagues, I should, I should warn you, I'm, I'm an experimentalist. Um, if, if I go and ask my theory colleagues, how many more isotopes might be out there that live a millisecond or so? Uh, I can get any prediction between 5,000 to 7,000, and I pick the bigger one because it's exciting to, to, to think what could be out there in terms of discovery, okay? And so all isotopes that are not normally found on Earth, those are the ones that will decay and they live for a short time. This is what we call rare isotopes, okay? And um, hydrogen one is the normal hydrogen, 99.99% of all the hydrogen you will find on Earth is exactly that. It has one proton and no neutron. And then 0.00115% will be having at its heart the deuteron, and then it's called deuterium. The atom is called deuterium. And then tritium is the one that has two neutrons in the nucleus, okay? And those are the three isotopes of hydrogen. So um, now what I, what I told you is that there are only 300 stable ones, but many thousand unstable ones, and they are subject to radioactive decay. Okay, and uh, I reproduce here for you a little bit about radioactive decay. So if one has a heavy nucleus like uranium, um, it can decay by alpha emission. So, and an alpha is nothing but 
the nucleus of a helium atom, two protons and two neutrons. So the nucleus becomes lighter by spitting out two protons and two neutrons that are bound to a helium nucleus. Okay, this is alpha decay. So then we have, we have beta decay, and in, in beta decay there are two different versions. There is uh, the beta minus decay and the beta plus decay that happens to be called positron emission here. And what happens is that the mass number, the A, does not change, but here one, one can see um, a neutron is, uh, a, a proton is being transformed into a neutron and so the proton number decreases by one and an electron is emitted to have charge conservation. So, and then it's exactly the other way around for the other beta decay, for beta plus decay, a proton is made into a neutron and a positron, which is the positively charged brother of the electron, is being emitted. Okay, that's beta decay. Mass doesn't change. For alpha decay, the mass changes by four. Okay, and then nuclei can be excited either by reactions or a decay can go to an excited state and the energetics of nuclei, unlike for atoms, is so that the energy um, can be spit out in the form of a gamma ray, not a photon in the visible light, a gamma ray, okay, which is very high energy radiation. And so here nothing changes with the nucleus, only it gets from an excited state to the ground state. So, and then there is another effect where a nucleus can capture one of its K-shell electrons um, and then undergo something like inverse beta decay. You see the proton number decreases by one. Um, and so we have, we have created a neutron. And then heavy nuclei like uranium or plutonium, they can fission and they split into two pieces. And why are all of these nuclei doing this? Well, because the state after they decay is energetically more favorable, okay? So the system is um, energetically more favorable when I have two of the smaller fragments rather than the big nucleus, okay? And that's the driving force. It's all about energy. So um, you can see that this becomes more complicated than the periodic table, okay? because now we have to worry about the neutron number. And so what nuclear physicists have invented is the nuclear chart. And the way we sort nuclei um, in the nuclear chart is we plot the proton number, that's the Z I showed you, versus the neutron number. And then each of these little squares is one of the isotopes, okay? And the elements count up like here. So hydrogen is way down here. And you see here those uh, two or three guys here, this is uranium and there's thorium down here. So in black, um, we, we always like to put the stable isotopes in, in black. These are the ones that are found in nature and there are some 254 and for them uh, no, no decay has been observed. So, and then you see here in uh, some darkish green, I don't know even how to call this, this color, um, there are more than 3,300 isotopes of all of these different elements that have been made on Earth in nuclear reactions, at accelerator facilities, in nuclear reactors. Um, and some information is known about them. Okay? So, but now, um, if we go and ask our theory colleagues how many more isotopes could be out there, you get this sort of fading out picture. Okay, and what you see immediately is there is a, a asymmetry versus um, having, having more protons than having more neutrons. So nuclei on this side have more neutrons than they have protons. And well, you can understand that protons, I did not want to do that. Protons are positively charged and they repel each other, okay? So you cannot keep on adding protons and this is why the nuclear existence stops closer to stability when you add protons, okay? But for neutrons, well, we don't know what the limit is. We don't know how many neutrons calcium can bind and still exist for the time before it beta decays. 
So now, if you take a look at my nuclear chart and of these little boxes that symbolize all the isotopes of the different elements, you see what the radioactive decay does that I showed you on the previous slide. So the beta decay, which was called electron emission or positron emission on the previous slide, doesn't change the mass number, so it goes diagonally here. And what happens is, if the nucleus is sitting on this side of stability, um, of the stable nuclei, it'll decay in this direction, okay? And this is the beta plus decay, and if it's sitting on this side of the stable nuclei, it'll decay in this direction, and that is the beta minus decay. So all of the radioactive decays will always go back so that ultimately the decay daughter reaches stability or granddaughter or many generations down, depending on where you are. And then alpha decay takes you way down here, for example. And this is how radioactive decay looks like on the nuclear chart. So I should introduce you to some terminology. Um, this limit here of the nuclear chart we call proton drip line because if you take a proton, you cannot stick it on anymore. It will not be bound because the Coulomb repulsion wins. The nuclear force is not strong enough to bind that additional protons. For neutrons, we don't have that problem and we can stick a whole lot of more neutrons onto our stable nucleus. Okay, and then that limit we call the neutron drip line and this is very poorly known, okay? That we don't know. And then way up here, this is uh, what is called the super heavy elements. Um, so there, um, I will talk a little bit about this uh, later. Um, there are attempts to form new elements and there it becomes exciting because uh, an, an element is characterized by its chemistry. Okay, and a new element will have new chemistry that one has to sort onto, onto the periodic table. And so I wanted to pull out uh, one nuclear chart for uh, one um, isotope chain for you and tell you a little bit about it. And some of these isotopes you will know very well. Carbon-12. Carbon-12 is our stable carbon that um, is predominant in nature and it's the, it's the origin of life in a, in, in a way. It's one of our uh, or humans or living things are mostly composed of carbon, okay? And then carbon-13 is also stable, but in nature it exists with very low abundance. So if you take naturally occurring carbon, only very little um, is carbon-13, okay? So carbon-14, you will have heard about, this is a famous isotope that is used for carbon dating, okay? And it has a half-life of about 6,000 years. And I should tell you what half-life means. Half-life means that thing is radioactive, and after about 6,000 years, half of it will be decayed. So if you have a block of carbon-14, after 6,000 years, if you're still around, you will only have half of it left. Okay, that's the terminology here. And then what can be done is this can be used for uh, carbon dating of things that were alive at some point and it's dated out to 10 half-lives. So 60,000 years the dating can go back. And let me explain to you why, why this can only be done for things that used to live. So carbon-14, it doesn't really exist on Earth. It's produced constantly by cosmic rays hitting nitrogen and, and oxygen um, atoms in our atmosphere, and they produce a little bit of carbon-14. And this carbon-14 is taken up by things that live, by plants, by us, and by animals, okay? And then... Um, when the person or the tree dies, there's no carbon taken up anymore. And then from the amount of carbon that is left, um, one can figure out when that thing died and stopped taking up new carbon, okay? So um, 6,000 years is not very short-lived. So now I can go all the way and keep on adding neutrons and the last known carbon isotope is carbon-22. And this thing has a half-life of 6.1 milliseconds, 
Okay, after 6.1 milliseconds, if you had two of them, only one is still there. Okay? And it has a very interesting nuclear structure. It's what we call a two-neutron halo. It has so many neutrons that they actually uh, form this kind of halo shape around what we refer to as a much more stable core. Okay? And here suddenly you see rare isotopes can have a very different structure. And it's also called the Borromean system. This is the a family sign of a famous Italian family. And if you take a look at these rings, if you cut any of the rings, all three will fall apart. And this is what happens here. If you take one of the neutrons away, you have carbon-21, and that doesn't exist. If you take the other neutron away, well, you still have carbon-21, and that doesn't exist. If you take the nucleus away, you have two neutrons, and they are not bound in, into a nucleus. Okay? And so these are things that happen for rare isotopes where we have many more neutrons than protons. So now I can take you to the other side of the nuclear chart. Um, the last known, huh? why is it not going? Carbon um, isotope that is very proton rich is carbon 9, um, and it lives. Uh, long enough to undergo beta decay. I think the half-life is not very well measured. If we go one more out here, carbon-8, um, this is essentially four, this is two neutrons and six protons, okay? So there is a lot of Coulomb repulsion. That thing does not want to stay together, and indeed it doesn't. It falls apart immediately when it's formed into beryllium-6 plus two protons, and the beryllium-6 falls apart into a helium nucleus and four protons, okay? So it disassembles as soon as it's formed on the level of faster than 10 to the minus 14 seconds, okay? So that thing does not exist. So the question is how, how do we produce rare isotopes on Earth? Um, and here's a, a very nice a timeline that two of my colleagues from Michigan State did. Um, it's, it's from a Nature article, From Isotopes to the Stars, and they plotted the isotope discoveries as function of time. And around 1900, people started to realize that in the natural decay chains, when uranium decays um, or the thorium decay chain, um, the lead nuclei that are produced in both decay chains, they have a different mass. And why do they have a different mass? Well, their neutron number is different. They are different isotopes of the lead element, okay? So, and, and then people found new isotopes. And then um, mass separation started. So one can take a sample of calcium and one can perform mass separation where the nuclei are separated by their mass to charge ratio. And one finds that there are three or four different isotopes of calcium. Okay, and this is this peak here in the 1920s. So um, then first accelerators came about, and with an accelerator, we can accelerate the nucleus and shoot it on a target, and these two nuclei, they can make a reaction and they can form a new element or a new isotope. Okay, and then World War II stopped all of the progress here. There's this dip here, um, and then it goes up, and here, the new isotopes were discovered mostly in reactors, okay? So you can imagine you have a, a stable nucleus or a fission fragment, and it captures neutrons, because in a, in a reactor, you have high fluxes of, of neutrons, and so it creates neutron-rich isotopes. Um, and then here, this is again, um, accelerator facilities have increasingly used reactions, like fusion reactions of a beam with a target to produce heavier nuclei and heavier isotopes of the different elements. And then here, all of the, in modern times, all of the new isotopes were um, produced by what we call fragmentation or in-flight fission. And I will tell you how this is uh, how this works, because this is how we produce rare isotopes now and subject them to experiments at rare isotope beam facilities around the world and in Michigan. 
And what you see here is the nuclear chart again. You see we are really in love with this way of plotting proton number versus neutron number. And color-coded is all how the different isotopes or the method with which the different isotopes were discovered, okay? So neutron-induced reactions bring you to the neutron-rich side. Um, fragmentation can go very neutron-rich. And then fusion reactions form heavier systems, okay? So um, isotopes, rare isotopes, can also be formed elsewhere, not on Earth. And the universe has indeed uh, many ways to produce rare isotopes. And it has ways to produce rare isotopes that have not been established or ever made on Earth. Okay, we have no accelerator yet powerful to actually get there. So what I'm showing you here again is the nuclear chart. And all of these colorful lines, um, they are so-called nucleosynthesis paths. And these are chains of reactions and decays that happen in stellar environments that happen in explosive scenarios. And I'll talk a bit, little bit more about this later on. And so what, what happens in all of these, on all of these lines is one has at some point a stable nucleus, and then in some stellar environment, it will undergo reactions. It can um, capture protons and emit a gamma ray. This is what happens on the proton-rich side of the nuclear chart. That's called the RP process, the rapid proton capture process. Okay, here on the neutron-rich side of the nuclear chart in purple, um, this is where really more than half of the heavy elements that are observed in the universe from satellite observations are produced. Okay, and this path pro proceeds almost entirely for the heavy systems in a territory where we have not even proven that such a nucleus can exist on Earth, okay? And so on, on this neutron-rich side of the, of the nuclear chart, one has a stable nucleus, and it captures neutrons in an environment that's very neutron-rich. And then it runs out um, towards the drip lines, and then um, for all of these capture reactions, if it's protons or neutrons, always what counteracts is the beta decay. Remember, the beta decay always brings you back towards stability. So there is a constant fight between capture reactions that bring you up to heavier nuclei and the beta decay of the radioactive isotope that doesn't want to be there, okay? Because it's energetically more favorable if it undergoes a radioactive decay. And then this can happen in various scenarios. And one of the most prolific ones that garnered attention a few years ago are neutron star mergers. And I get back to that. So uh, one part of contemporary research um, is exploring these limits of existence. What combinations of protons and neutrons can I make into a nucleus? Okay. And so um, for me, uh, personally, this is sort of a fundamental question. How many calcium isotopes are out there? Okay? And so um, I'm an experimentalist, and you know, for me, physics is uh, also an experimental science. And so what we have to do is we have to produce the thing, we have to identify it unambiguously, and then we have to prove that it is what we think it is. Okay? And then if we have made enough of them, we can Look at its properties. How long does it live? What is the half-life? Okay, what is the mass of it? And so, um, for this, let me, let me tell you how we actually produce these rare isotopes in the laboratory, okay? And so, um, what we do is, um, in accelerators, uh, we accelerate stable isotopes up to at my facility, 50% of the speed of light, and we smash it very ungracefully into a target nucleus, okay? And this is most of the time carbon. And so then what, what happens is really a violent collision where the projectile fragments into many pieces, okay? And you can already see that every once in a while, one of these fragments will be a rare isotope that has a very unusual combination of protons and neutrons, okay? And then these rare isotopes 
we have to fish out and guide to whatever the experimental end station is, okay? And then measure um, the properties we want to measure. And so for isotope discovery, what we actually do is um, we produce it and then we detect it and we identify it unambiguously. So um, the way the isotopes of interest are separated out is by um, magneto optics. So what we do is we have a beam of all these different isotopes and most of them have different mass to charge ratios. And so they are bent differently in a magnetic field. Okay, and then the magnets are set so that only the mass to charge ratio of the isotope of interest can make it through to the end and all the others crash left and right into, into the sides, okay? And we have a movie for that in a second. So all of this is actually done, maybe you didn't know this, at Michigan State University. We are better known as an agricultural university. We are very good in turf science. Um, and ever since the 60s, we have had an accelerator facility, okay? And until about uh, 2020, um, we were the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, and that was funded by the National Science Foundation as a user facility for um, doing science with rare isotopes. And as you see from the name, our accelerator was a cyclotron, okay? And so, um, a few years ago, in 2007, 2008, we were awarded by the Department of Energy the opportunity to build the next generation rare isotope facility for the US and for the world. Um, and that is called the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, and it started operations just two years ago, okay? So, four years ago, the old facility shut down, and um, the new facility, which was for many years under construction, was tied into the building with the, with the existing detectors, and we could do science with it, okay? And now, ever since it started operations, FRIP has been ramping up its capabilities and providing more opportunities to produce and study the properties of these rare isotopes. And our user community is about 1,800 members from all over the world. Um, they can be experimentalists, they can be chemists, they can be theorists, and they're all interested in using or calculating or modeling um, the properties of these rare isotopes. And um, the, the beauty is, um, you, I know you will hear about Brookhaven National Lab, and you, you might have heard about other national labs. Ours is in the middle of a campus with students around, okay? And so across of us, we have plant biology. Also, MSU is famous for plant biology. Um, the vet school is here, performing arts right next door. The not so famous law school is across as well. And then we have chemistry, physics, and biochemistry in walking distance. So our students, they get their degrees in physics or chemistry, and then we can just walk over and teach, and they can walk over and uh, we can do research together. And that's the beauty of having such a facility on the campus, in the middle of the campus of a university. And um, I'll, I'll show you this in a movie, but I wanted to, to guide you through a little bit. Um, I mentioned we accelerate stable nuclei up to 50% of the speed of light. Okay, and that is now not done in a cyclotron anymore, but it's done in a linear accelerator. And this linear accelerator, because we have performing arts and the vet school next door, is shaped like a paperclip, okay? Because we are landlocked. And then at the end of this acceleration, the nuclei with 50% of the speed of light crash into a carbon target, and then fragmentation happens. Or if this nucleus is maybe uranium, fission can be induced, and the uranium falls into two pieces, which is fission. Okay, and then out of this, using magnetic separation that I explained to you, mass to charge, nuclei with different mass to charge take a different path in a magnetic field. We filter them out and guide them to the experiments. And they can either be used at 50% of the speed of light for experiments at these high velocities, or 
Um, they can be implanted into a detector and we watch all of their decays. You know, a clock starts when it's implanted and the clock starts when the beta particle comes. And then we can measure its half-life very easily. Okay, or we have another mechanism. We can thermalize the beams in a high pressure gas cell, extract them and subject them to very high precision measurements. And these measurements can be laser spectroscopy, for example. And I'll tell you what this might be good for. But now let me show you an- Scientists study rare isotopes, the forms of elements that are not normally found in nature. They will be created at EFRIP using a 1600 foot linear accelerator bent into segments and shaped like a paperclip. To create these rare isotopes, FRIB researchers will start with a collection of stable atoms and move them through a gas of electrons where their electrons are removed, resulting in positively charged ions. Next, the positively charged ions are guided into the linear accelerator where they pass through each segment, gaining increasingly more speed and eventually reaching up to half the speed of light and directed toward a target. As the stream of ions strikes a target, the resulting collisions cause the ions to lose or gain neutrons or protons and become unstable, thus producing thousands of different types of rare isotopes, sometimes highly unstable and existing only fractions of a second. For what lasts merely fractions of a second, the rare isotopes continue to move through a series of magnets, filtering out the undesired types leaving a pure beam with only the desired rare isotope. FRIB has the unique capability to offer researchers fast, stopped, and reaccelerated beams allowing experiments at the desired energy for all available rare isotopes. I wanted to tell you uh, very briefly the history. So groundbreaking happened in March of 2014, and you see in March in Michigan, we still have snow on the ground, and there are the dignitaries um, shoveling, okay? And we actually had to put a sandbox there because the ground was frozen. So this is a bit of a fake ground, ground, groundbreaking that you see here. And then um, three years later, um, this is the same kind of area. All of the civil construction was completed and beneficial occupancy was taken of, of these buildings, and then they were filled with the linear accelerator components. And so, but let me get back to uh, producing these new isotopes and how we, how we actually say that we produced one. Um, and in this particular experiment that I was involved in, um, we used as the stable beam that's accelerated to half the speed of light, um, the nucleus platinum-198, okay? And it collided with the target and then produced in its debris, or it's pop it populated these kinds of rare isotopes. And then to get out new ones, we use this fragment separator. You see here in, in green, those are magnets that bend the beam around the corner. And in purple, these are magnets that focus the beam. Okay, and you see there is a very complicated magnetic separation that we use and then at the end we hope to have mostly the rare isotopes that we are interested in. And so uh, the, the targets of interest here were these um, isotopes marked in, in yellow. So um, what we can measure for these isotopes is we can send them in a detector and measure the energy that is being lost in this detector. And the more protons or the more electrons an ion has, the more energy it loses, okay? So by measuring energy loss, we can determine the Z of what we produced at the end of the fragment separator. And then we can, the beam is so fast, 50% of the speed of light, we can have detectors that are separated by many meters, and one of them starts a clock when the particle passes through, and the other one stops the clock when the particle passes through, and then we have measured the velocity, okay? 
And then the velocity can be translated into a combination of mass and charge. And this is shown here, mass minus three times the charge. If we plot this, Z versus the mass minus three times the charge, we get this beautiful pattern. And these, the technical term is blobs. Okay, And then everything to the right of this red line had never been observed before on Earth. Okay, And so here we have identified all of these different blobs and we could give them names and we could even look at gamma rays. I told you about gamma rays that come from excited states and we could confirm that what we think is tantalum 188 is indeed tantalum 188 and then you just count. Okay, and then you can prove who is who to the right side of the, of the red line. Okay, and so it turned out that um, these new isotopes were five never before seen nuclei, and those were the heaviest of the elements thulium, ytterbium, and lutetium. Okay, and they're shown here well at the fringes of the nuclear chart in yellow. And so you know, the power of this experiment is really in this fragment separator with the many magnets. And the experimental setup, the detectors that the beam passes through, they're really tabletop. And you see here two of my colleagues with this tabletop detection system. But then you have meters and meters of magnets that facilitate the separation of all the mess that you produced in the fragmentation. And so, um, we got some weird press on this. This is like weird lab made atoms hint at heavy metals cosmic origin. How does this happen? Well, these nuclei are actually close to the path of the R process I pointed out to you on a previous slide that runs well on the neutron rich side of the nuclear chart and that happens in environments that are very neutron rich. Okay, so by being able to show, we can produce these nuclei and we can identify them, we can tag them event by event, measure their velocity, measure their energy loss and, and give them a name, we will actually be able to measure their properties as well and properties such as the half-life that I spoke about before. And as soon as we can do that, this is very, very important information to understand how the heavy elements were made in the universe. Okay, And it's now thought that the heavy elements are predominantly made in neutron star mergers um, and this is what the popular press connected this to. So um, what I talked to you about is how we discover new isotopes. Everybody knew that there is lutetium and thulium and all of this and we just could show how many neutrons you can add. But what about heavy, heavy elements or what about how many elements are out there. And at the moment, 118 elements have been made and identified and confirmed um, officially, okay? And so um, if you think about what I told you, how we produce these rare isotopes, we take a heavy nucleus, the heaviest we can ever accelerate is uranium because nothing else above uranium is stable enough. By smashing it into pieces, you will never make super heavy elements, okay? So this is not physics that can be done at the Michigan facility. This um, requires different kinds of experiments where one has very high intensity um, stable beams, such as you can read it off here, calcium 48, or um, now the newest kit on the block is titanium 50. Uh, zinc 70, and that is being shot at lower energies, maybe 6% of the speed of light, if I may speak in velocity, onto heavy targets such as lead, bismuth, or exotic targets such as neptunium, okay, which are unstable, and um, I don't want to deal with the radiation safety of using such a target. Okay? And then these two nuclei fuse, and they can produce the heavy elements. The, in fact, the heaviest elements um, all have been produced in this way of fusing very high intensity stable beams with radioactive actinite targets, curium, berkelium, californium. Okay? And so the most recent 
um, elements that were officially recognized um, by the by the union of 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 applied chemistry are uh, nihonium, moscovium, tennessine, and organesion. Okay, and they are named after um, sort of the history of their this discovery. Nihonium was in an absolute heroic effort discovered in Japan. Um, the poor research group had two or three years of machine time, of beam time, and shifts, and they found two of these events, okay? So really heroic job. Moscovium, Tennessee, and Organesson were produced in Russia at the super heavy, or at what now is the super heavy element factory. And they have the name Tennessee because this very exotic target was produced in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Okay? And so Tennessee got the credit in naming of the element that was produced at the facility in Russia doing the fusion reaction that I spoke about. And then um, Organesson is named um, after the scientist Yuri Organesian, who has been behind many of those. Um, element discovery and studies of fusion reactions to optimize the production of new elements. And so, um, how do you identify that you have a new element? Well, all of these are very heavy, and what they do is they alpha decay. Um, I, I told you alpha decay is it uh, spits out a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons, and then it does this in chains, and at some point, Along this chain, you end up in a nucleus you know, and then you just count alpha particles, and then you can calculate what was produced up there, okay? So you have to uh, bootstrap from the alpha decay chains into known territory and figure out what was produced in this fusion reaction. And so you can see that there are many uncertainties, and typically, um, such discoveries have to be made at several laboratories and using different beam and target combinations, producing the same new element. Um, and then it's being recognized. So you can see here in this timeline for the new elements, 118, 17, 16, and 15, many, many years, sometimes decades, before the discovery was accepted, the first claim was made. And then researchers worked for many years to find different ways of producing it or, or to reproduce the results. So this is very hard work. So um, new isotopes, well, they make it into Scientific American and new elements make it into the New York Times. Why is that? Well, a new element, it has new chemistry. You have to figure out, does it behave like radon? Where does it belong? On in, in the periodic table on our nuclear chart, you can draw now blindfolded, I showed you so many, where this isotope goes because you just count protons and neutrons. Okay? For new elements, it's a totally different story. And so for me, uh, searching for these new isotopes, even if we don't make it into the New York Times, it answers a very fundamental question. What combinations of protons and neutrons can be made into a rare isotope that exists long enough before it beta decays? Um, if you think about people that want to develop the models that say how many isotopes are out there, well, it's a really good benchmark. If I tell you something exists and your model cannot say that it exists, Maybe there's something missing in the model. So there's a very important feedback loop that this is. And then in many astrophysical scenarios, in very neutron-rich environments, reactions actually run up to this neutron drip line. So if you don't know where that drip line is, you don't know where those reactions end. And that changes your predictions of the abundances of the elements in the universe. Okay? And right now, the, the prospect is quite nice. Um, for, we are fortunate enough that FRIP is up and running, and so um, charting the or looking for new isotopes has just begun. For, so for new elements, um, this also has become very exciting. Just a few weeks ago, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory showed that heavy elements can be produced with a titanium beam. This was a first. 
and they got the press here, US, back in race to forge unknown super heavy elements. And the excitement is so big because since element 107, all of them were made abroad, okay? Mostly in, 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 in Russia, in Japan, uh, and in Germany, okay? And now the US is back in the race, um, thanks to titanium beam. So for me, as an experimenter, if I have a physics question, I have this entire nuclear chart at my disposal, and depending on the physics question I have, I can study the nucleus that might give me the answer very clearly. And I show you here a fantastic picture of iron-45 entering a detector, slowing down, and then it decays by the spontaneous emission of two protons. So if I'm interested in what two protons are doing inside the nucleus, that is the system I want to study because I can measure the angles and from the length of these tracks, I can even measure their energy. And then I can reconstruct what did these two protons do inside iron 45. So if we go to very neutron rich nuclei, they will look like this because it, there are so many neutrons, they will form a skin around the nucleus and this is maybe the only way, using that thing for reactions, to study neutron matter in the laboratory. Because this has a really thick neutron skin of maybe more than half a Fermi. Okay? And so, um, if, if one looks at the properties of this short-lived um, rare isotopes, this is not your textbook nuclear physics. There were two Nobel Prizes given um, in the 60s and in the 70s for describing the structure of nuclei. Um, and the first one for Maria Gerhard Meyer and, and Hans Jensen was for describing the shell structure of nuclei. This is uh, similar to, to atoms where noble gases are very stable. They are magic numbers in nuclei um, and, and nuclei that have these magic numbers of protons and neutrons are very stable. And then uh, these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize for describing the nucleus as a liquid drop made out of proton and neutron liquid that can rotate and that can vibrate and that can excite collectively um, under collective participation of the protons and neutrons. So this is a sort of single particle picture and this is a collective picture, okay? But now if we go to these rare isotopes that we can produce now, the shell structure is not what is in your textbooks, okay? And suddenly um, nuclei get very interesting shapes, very different shapes. And collectivity vibrations, rotations appear in places of the nuclear chart where you would not expect this. So this is not your nuclear physics or not, not your textbook nuclear structure that we are dealing with. And this is now exciting for theorists because with these modified properties we can really understand how does the shell structure change, for example. And so what can we measure? Um, I already told you we can measure half-lives, we can implant a nucleus, start a clock and wait until the beta decay electron or positron comes and stop the clock. And with this we get decay curves and we can tell you the half-life. We can also take a more modern approach. Electronics takes continuous traces for a long time and the first alpha particle comes and it measures the height and even the energy. The height is the energy and it measures the time and the second alpha particle comes and it measures the height and the time. And suddenly we have characterized in one shot two alpha decays. We can trap nuclei put them in a magnetic field and they will take a circular orbit and the frequency of this rotation is inversely proportional to the mass and we can tell you very precisely the mass of a nucleus. Okay, and we can subject nuclei to laser spectroscopy or atoms I should say and the proton distribution has an impact on the energy levels of the atom and so with this we can measure the charge radius or the proton distribution inside nuclei, okay? Or we can look at these uh, very exotic decays to give you an idea, this is not a very big detector, there is a person standing next to the detector, okay? 
So, and the magic is really in producing these isotopes and providing them to these experiments. We can also take a look at how nuclei de-excite. This is what I do for a living. Okay, so we can measure excitation schemes of nuclei and look at them via gamma ray emissions. And then this is how such detectors look like. They're typically solid state based. We can also look at um, how long these excited state lives by where they decay relative to a target in a reaction. And we can look at all sorts of reactions, very violent one, ones where the nuclei fall apart or very gentle scattering um, in a magnetic field where we see um, the light particle that the beam scatters off um, taking a spiral curve. Or we can look at reactions where protons or neutrons are, are transferred and the ejectiles we can nicely identify. So many, many things can be measured with things that only live a few milliseconds, okay? And so now um, what, I, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about is um, how, wh what the role is of rare isotopes in understanding um, the abundances of the elements in the universe and how explosive scenarios such as supernova, um, X-ray bursts, or what we call kilonova are powered. And this gets me back to this plot right here with all of the different nucleosynthesis paths, okay? And now you know about reactions and you know about decays and you can see that there is a constant competition between reactions that bring you up the nuclear chart or to the right of the nuclear chart and the beta decay that always brings you back towards stability. And so um, what rare isotopes are really needed for is to answer the question, how did we get from um, the three elements here, this is, even I could be a chemist with this one, there's hydrogen and helium and lithium, some, sometime 10 to the minus five seconds after the Big Bang, to what we have right now, the periodic table, okay? So, and how we got there, the understanding requires to know how rare isotopes and stable nuclei, what the properties of rare isotopes and stable nuclei are. So here's a very nice um, picture of the abundance of all of the elements in our solar system and somehow the diameter of these uh, bubbles uh, relates to the abundance. And you can see there is a lot of hydrogen and helium and then some lighter elements, but also the heavy elements are present in the universe, okay? And here is the um, periodic table color-coded by the suspected origin, which scenario generated these particular elements. Okay, and this can be um, the end of a low mass star, this can be neutron star merger, this can be an exploding white dwarf, and all of these scenarios involve nuclear physics because they involve reactions and decays. And they involve reactions and decays of things that nobody has ever made or that we have made but we haven't figured out all the properties yet. And so um, one of the pressing questions um, is really how were half of the elements beyond iron produced? And this is the process that I referred to as our process which proceeds almost entirely in this region where we don't even, where we have not even shown that the nuclei exist. So what do we know what the half-life is or how they react? And so this is, there is an interesting uh, story behind this and it connects to um, somebody who is actually on your wall as Nobel Prize uh, winner, Burbridge, Burbridge, Fowler, Hoyle, um, wrote a seminal paper, Synthesis of the Elements in Stars. And Willie Fowler is the person that is on, on your wall as a Nobel Prize winner um, about the formation of the heavy elements. And so in their famous paper, they figured out of all of the gold that exists in the universe and on Earth, only 10% were made by what, they, what was known as the slow neutron capture process. Proceeds very close to stability, nucleus captures a neutron, beta decays, captures a neutron, and so on. And they postulated that's not, that cannot produce the gold we have. So there has to be a rapid neutron capture process 
that is very fast in duration. It proceeds in neutron densities where one has 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 28 neutrons per cubic centimeter. Okay, this is a lot of neutrons. And it runs out to where um, neutron capture and photo disintegration is in an equilibrium. And this is what this means. You have a stable nucleus. You have an enormous neutron flux. It captures neutrons, neutrons, neutrons. And at some point here, these reactions gamma n and gamma are in equilibrium. And then it beta decays. And you capture again and then beta decay. And this is how you run up the nuclear chart over the period of a few seconds. Okay, And then at some point, you run into very heavy nuclei and fission makes this picture even more complicated. Okay, so now um, what can we provide in the laboratory? Well, to understand if these reactions happen, we need to know the masses of these nuclei because the masses tell us if it's energetically favorable to capture that neutron or what energy you need for that neutron to be captured. Okay, and um, we need half-lives because the beta decay always brings you back towards stability. And how fast is it doing that? And then there can be beta decay to neutron unbound states and suddenly you lose neutron in the beta decay. That you have to understand. Okay, and then as soon as you run into fission, you have to understand what the fission distribution is. And so this is an extremely complex program or problem. And at the heart are the properties of nuclei in this area here where we don't know anything. And so this R process is thought to proceed in the collision of two neutron stars. And you can see, well, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 28 neutrons, where do I have that? Well, maybe in a star that's mostly made out of neutrons. Okay, so neutron stars, they are absolutely fascinating objects. If you allow me to forget about black holes for a second, um, they are probably the most compact, dense objects in the universe. Okay, and they come about um, at the end of the life of a massive star. When a massive star dies and runs out of fuel, um, depending on its mass, um, so it'll, it'll explode in a supernova, and depending on its mass, if it's a very high mass, more than three times the solar mass, it'll become a black hole. If it's less than three times the solar mass, it will become that object, the neutron star, okay? So, and th this for me is, I cannot even understand this. One teaspoon of neutron star matter would weigh 10 million tons. That's how dense a neutron star is, okay? And so, um, that means they only have 12 miles in diameter, but almost two times the solar mass. Okay, that's a lot of mass on very little um, volume. And they rotate very rapidly. Um, and they were, or they were discovered through radio waves that they emit, and then they are called pulsars, okay? And I read there is an estimate from NASA that they're 10 billion neutron stars just in our Milky Way, okay? And so now this is sort of a simple picture of a, of a neutron star. It has an inner crust and it has an outer crust and it has a core. Um, and in the, in the crusts, this is really where uh, all of the neutron richness is and where the high um, neutron numbers um, or the high neutron density is. And so now what happens, what can happen on the surface of a neutron star, a neutron star has an enormous gravitational pull. And when it's in a binary system with a low mass companion, it will accrete matter from this low mass companion. And then a thermonuclear runaway can start. Um, and this flash is an X-ray burst. And this is some of the most um, frequent explosions in the universe. And then you can have two neutron stars meet collide, and this is a neutron star merger, okay? And so, but before the neutron star merger was observed, very famously in 2017 by the LIGO collaboration from the ripple it did in space-time from its gravitational wave, uh, there was a young researcher at MIT who looked at what is called ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. 
and she and her postdoc looked at the elemental abundances in these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. And she found, for some of them, enormous concentrations of what we call R-process nuclei. This is characterized here by the, ra by the ratio of barium over hydrogen. So when, whenever it has a lot of barium over hydrogen, it must have been made in an R process. But not all of them have it. So the conclusion was very interesting. She concluded, well, the R process must happen in a rare prolific event because it's not in all of these dwarf galaxies. If it was happening in supernova, they are all around us. Um, that would not look like this. So she, she predicted this in 2016. In 2017, the LIGO collaboration measured the ripple of a neutron star merger from the gravitational wave, and they named it GW170817, okay? And so optical observations immediately kicked in, and they found this glow in the aftermath of the neutron star merger, and this glow is all the beta decay radiation transformed into visible lights through all sorts of gas clouds. And this is the afterglow of the R process. So astronomers have now seen the R process in action. And from the light, they could figure out lanthanides are being produced in this site, and those are R process nuclei, okay? So very exciting. And at EFRIP, what we hope to be able to do, this is again the nuclear chart, this line shows how far we can measure this line here, and then color code it in terms of intensity, the importance of mass measurements and beta decay measurements. And we can catch many of them, but we cannot catch all of them. And this is why we need theory being able to extrapolate. Once we make the measurements, they have a solid ground to extrapolate to the ones we can never measure, okay? And I already mentioned this, um, when the neutron star is engaged, with a low mass companion, shown here, it can accrete matter and then thermonuclear runaway happens with a frequency of hours to days and these are called X-ray bursts and they are some of the most frequent explosions in the universe. And they are being observed with space-based telescopes and these are the light curves. And if one models the light curve and one jiggles only one of the nuclear reactions, one P-gamma reaction, the shape of the light curve changes. It suddenly gets a hump here and the tail becomes different. So nuclear physics even connects to explaining the light curves we see from these X-ray bursts that happen on the um, surface of accreting neutron stars, okay? And so they are powered by the RP process. This is the process I pointed out to you at the proton drip line, proton captures, okay? and then beta decay always drives you back towards stability. So also here, rare isotopes are needed. So um, there is a great synergy with multi-messenger astronomy. Um, X-ray telescopes, they measure these light curves. They are gamma-ray telescopes. They look, for example, the rare isotope aluminum-26. It has a famous gamma-ray, and it can map the aluminum-26 abundance in the universe. James Webb Space Telescope has as one of its mission to figure out the origin of the heavy elements in the universe. And then we have a connection to LIGO and Virgo because the afterglow of a neutron star merger can only be described as nuclear physics. And then there is a lot of modeling going on, computational models of neutron stars merging, of nuclei reacting. And of course, neutron stars are very extreme objects, and so extreme matter theory is part of it. So, Rare isotope science is part of this multi-messenger astrophysics enterprise. And with this, um, I will end on showing you just very few examples of how we can put the rare isotopes to use for society or for the nation. And th that'll be medical isotopes, imaging of biological processes, Nuclear data of importance for the nation, for example, for stockpile stewardship or for nuclear batteries. Um, and then how we use accelerator technology to, to, to test uh, microelectronics uh, towards the damage of cosmic rays. 
So beautiful pictures. Um, this is some work coming out of Japan. And what they do is for rice plants, they put one in soil and one in water. And then they put radioactive isotopes in the soil or in the water and image from the beta and gamma, ray detect gamma rays that are emitted from these rare isotopes in the water or in the soil, how quickly the plant uptakes nutrients. And this is a radioactive phosphorus isotope. And you might know that phosphorus is the main ingredient in fertilizer. So one can see rice plants really grow very well in water and they don't take up nutrients in soil. Okay? So quite spectacular picture here. And a similar picture, same methodology, different isotopes uh, put for plants. And then strangely enough, the heavy isotopes are uptaken very quickly into the tips of the leaves, while the lighter isotopes are sort of staying down here. Okay, so this is very interesting for plant biology. Um, nuclear batteries are being used in space probes, Voyager, Galileo, all of this, if you, this is not your nine volt block battery that goes there because that would not hold for tens of, of years. Those are nuclear batteries and they rely on nuclear fission. And this is one pellet um, that is part of the nuclear battery that went on the Galileo mission. It's made out of plutonium 238 oxide um, and just through fission and the beta decay of the fission fragments, it generates heat. And this heat is then made into, into el electricity and that powers these space probes, okay? So, and then very recently, by just measuring all of the radiation that comes from fission fragments, a big puzzle in reactor physics could be uh, solved. In a reactor, when you put the, the regulation rods in and you turn off your reactor, the cooling water still has to flow because the fission doesn't stop. It will fission and then the beta decay will still happen at the time of milliseconds, seconds, whatever the half-life is. And they saw that they needed too much cooling given their models. Okay, there was too much heat generated. That was not in the models. And they found a number of fission fragments where nuclear data completely underestimated the decay heat that they generate in a reactor. Okay, so this was important for safe operations of nuclear reactors. Then um, our, our colleagues from what we call the weapons labs, in the absence of new nuclear weapon tests, they use very old archival underground test data to study the warheads, and they do this by looking at the fission yields. Well, similar as in a reactor or in a neutron star collision, you have a very high neutron flux in these environments. And so the fission fragments react with neutrons. So if you look at the fission fragments, they don't tell you anything about the device. You need to figure out um, what the fission fragments undergoing neutron reactions tell you about the device. And so there is great interest in performing reactions of unstable nuclei. Fission fragments are mostly unstable. Um, and sort of simulate neutron-induced reactions, okay? And then I wanted to end on an upbeat note, and those are medical isotopes. And this is where the radioactive decay I told you about, the alpha decay in particular, is put to extremely good use to the use of destroying cancer cells. And I'm showing you here maybe the most famous picture in applied nuclear physics, okay? This is patient A described in this particular paper. You see, they didn't do nature or science. It was a brief communication from a hospital in Heidelberg. And this was a patient, an uh, older gentleman with metastasized prostate cancer. At the end of any treatment, there was no solution anymore. And you see all of these black dots here, this is where the cancer cells have invaded the lymphatic system, okay? And in Germany, and according to European law, if a patient is at that stage of treatment, experimental treatments can be applied if the patient agrees, of course. And the experimental treatment was to take actinium-225, which is an alpha emitter, put it into a chelator, a chemical that brings it to metabolic, very 
active areas, and these are these cancer cells. They need a lot of energy. And after three treatments, there's no sign of cancer anymore, okay? And then out of prophylaxis, they made one more cancer treatment, and to my understanding, the person uh, did not die of cancer afterwards. And so actinium-225 is very interesting. It's part of a decay chain. As I told you, it always goes to stability. Um, and actinium-225 decays by an alpha, the daughter decays by an alpha, and the granddaughter decays by an alpha. And you see, if you just get one actinium-225 to the cancer cell, it's bombarded by all of these radiations. Okay? And so um, this is a fantastic use for radioactivity and for rare isotopes, and the race is on to now industrially produce actinium-225. There's a company that just opened up in Wisconsin. Um, and also the race for more of these targeted alpha emitters that can do all of these good things. And then um, accelerator technology, accelerating things to half of the speed of light. There was a report testing at the speed of light. The National Academy said there is a shortage of chip testing in the US. And all electronics that go spacebound or in self-driving cars, if you, if you fancy about this, they have to be tested against cosmic ray damage. With an accelerator, we can shoot as many particles as you like into that poor electronics. And within a few minutes, we can simulate the damage done in tens of years of cosmic rays. And this is what this report talks about. And the lab laboratories in the US that are back to doing this is Texas A&M, Lawrence Berkeley, um, and our facility at Michigan State. And with this, I'm at the end. I hope I could show you that rare isotopes are very important for our fundamental understanding of physics. We don't know what the limits of nuclear existence are. We don't know how many elements there are. We don't know how many isotopes there are. Um, this is important if you want to understand the origin of elements in the universe or our origin. We have a very deep connection to multi-messenger astronomy. Every explosion you see in the universe, nuclear physics plays a role. And that most of the time plays a role in nuclei that are rare isotopes and that undergo decays. I hope I could show you um, their fantastic and broad applications of rare isotopes for the nation and for society, and well, if you ever come to Michigan, take a tour of the facility for rare isotope beams, because right now the US and Michigan is home to the most advanced of these. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. As probably everybody knows, there's a procedure, there's people with microphones. All right, let's start with uh, Frederica, red, quest, red microphone. Yes, I, I'm Frederica Darima, I'm a member. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful excursion in the world of rare aristopes generation. I, of course, as we've discussed before, my interest has been understanding the nuclear force. Mm -hmm. So how, what, how we can use these to enhance the, our kind of the understanding of how to represent the nuclear force in more reliable ways, because we do not know its nature, or at least how to represent it mathematically. And so my, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so there are many things that we look, in a sense, in terms of, uh, you know, deriving or testing our models for the real, like uh, yeah. uh, energy levels, electromagnetic transitions, and so on. And so all these radar isotopes, when they are created, they are not created all in the Question. ground states. They are created exactly. also in excited yes. states. Yes. So is there any effort to use this kind of information to enhance our understanding of the nuclear force? So what, yes. what efforts? Absolutely. That is exactly my research. So um, I'm using nuclear reactions um, at 50% of the speed of light or 30% of the speed of light to populate nuclei in their excited states. And then I'm looking at the gamma ray decays. And then I collaborate with shell model theorists and um, they model the data and very often it's like, well, if I turn it upside down, maybe it looks like my calculation. And then we have learned something because then we can uh, try to figure out what's missing in the model. You know, maybe, maybe the shell closer broke down and I cannot use this core or that valence space. 
And so um, this information is um, absolutely being used to refine the models in a quite fantastic feedback loop between um, having a measurement, interpreting the data, figuring out what's missing in the theory, and then theory telling me as experimenter, it would be great if you could measure that. And then I can go write a proposal and measure that. And so there is, is, is quite beautiful connection. And it's not just energy levels, it's also masses. One can look for uh, changes in the mass surface, you know, sudden kinks or origin or, or signs of deformation where suddenly the mass go, uh, increases. And so uh, all of this can be then modeled with density functional theory and that can then support this. So um, I would say on all fronts, all properties that we measure, we confront with theory um, and we learn what is missing in the theory and the theorists tell us which system would give them the most information. Yes. Yeah, to ask a follow-up. Uh, so are the models that are used for from the kind of this kind of measurements that yeah. you just described very eloquently and, and very in detail, are they also used then in the more stable nuclei yes. and to test in a sense whether you know, the model really is an improvement. Yes, and this is very important. So um, imagine we take the nuclear shell model and then I provide data to my colleague and then um, they modify their model to fit my data, but then they screwed up what happens at stability. Absolutely, this is all being checked, yeah, yes. Great. So um, there are some papers where uh, people do a local um, modification and then you ask what happens two nuclei closer to stability and then there's silence. That does happen. But um, yeah, in a, in a serious approach, um, one, one, one compares the whole region and you cannot break anything by fixing something. Yes. Hi, I'm Ed Tacken and I have two questions. And one of your early plots, as a function of time, you showed the a discovery of rare yes. isotopes per year. Yes. And all of a sudden, the last year for which there was data, it was way higher than exactly. the previous 1,000. Yeah, it How was 100. That That's yes. my first question. Yeah, I will tell you. And the second question is, if a nucleus is neutron rich, yeah. why aren't the neutrons in the center instead of the outside? The, the, the protons repel each other, and they should squeeze to the outside. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let, let me first start with your first question. So um, in that year, I think it was 2010 or 2011, this is when our competitor facility in Japan turned on. And their first mission was to discover as many isotopes as they could. And they m discovered 100 new isotopes in their first year. That is the spike you saw at the very end. Um, that was a decision for what the priority of this facility is, yes. Um, that, that, and in terms of neutron-rich nuclei, so what happens is, um, and that's facilitated by what is called the symmetry energy, so um, the core of a very neutron-rich nuclei, nu nucleus, is almost balanced in terms of numbers of neutrons and protons, has some more neutrons, and then the excess neutrons go around the surface. And um, this is driven um, by what we call the symmetry energy, which tries to keep some balance. Of course, you're right. If the only goal was to combat um, repulsion, you would put all the neutrons in the center and you would have the protons as far away as you can. Um, but the nuclear force is, is very complex, as Frederica mentioned, and you actually want to exploit that um, the force between the neutrons and protons is strong and you use the neutrons as a glue, okay, to keep the protons in the core and, and then the other um, neutrons assemble around it. So that, that's a property of the nuclear force and it might be counterintuitive, exactly as you say, but yeah, this is just one other reflection of the complexity that it is. Red microphone. Hello, I'm Julian hey. Freund, and uh, it's kind of a basic question, but uh, can different isotopes of the same elements have, like, different electronegativity? Electronegativity, that's a chemical term, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, is that, that going to stay the same throughout then? Yeah. So, okay. um, in terms of the chemistry, 
there are programs going on to see how does the chemistry changes if I take different isotopes? And the effects are, at the moment, very, very small. So um, I would say probably electronegativity is such a big and dominant effect. I don't think it's impacted by the neutron number, but um, it is an active field of chemical research where people look for very small effects. What happens if I have a heavy isotope or a light isotope of the same element? That's a good question, and it's not basic at all. Actually, it's a good question. Yeah. Blue microphone. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, people occasionally talk about discovering the next element. Yes. What does that stand? Yeah. So um, I showed you the timeline and the ordeal it was to have element 118 um, discovered. Um, and now um, the excitement is, um, I, should, I should explain this. Um, so at some point, um, you run out of combinations of targets and beams because, you know, the number of protons or the element number of your heavy, of your super heavy element can only be the number of target nuclei plus the number of beam nuclei. And that gets you, for all the combinations that have been used to date, only to 118. And the breakthrough was in Berkeley, where now people don't use calcium 48 beam anymore, but titanium 50 beam. And suddenly you have two more protons. Titanium has two more protons than calcium. And so um, the goal is now to discover elements 120 and 119, because this can be done with very radioactive actinite targets and a titanium 50 beam. Yes, so, and the first exploratory reactions have been done and they were published and that, I don't think it made it in the New York Times, but I think it was on the CNN front page. Anyway, so that's very exciting. And I know, I, I know they will now start to have long beam times to produce element 19, 119 or 120, yeah. So this is actually very timely and coming up soon. I mean, at least the attempts, I, you know, maybe in 10 years you can invite the person who has discovered that element, the new element, Good after idea. it was confirmed. Good idea, yeah. See? All right, we're going to go to the web. We have questions from the YouTube uh, chat on the live stream. We do. We have a question from Joel, who's a member. It's kind of a two-part question. Um, Joel asks, in terms of the radiation we observe in the universe, how much is thought to be the result of the decay of these types of rare isotopes. And I wonder if we've seen any of the spectra we detect on other planets, especially those, say, in the TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, the second part, I don't think I can, I can answer because I'm not that deep into um, astronomy and I don't know these different systems. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting question, sort of, see the radiation from, um, the decay of rare isotopes. So kilonova, the faint dot I showed you, this was um, celebrated as an enormous success and it was the first and so far only discovery of a, what is called kilonova, the afterglow of a neutron star merger. So in these X-ray bursts where I told you they are the most frequent explosions in the universe, um, we don't see the radiation of the rare isotopes um, directly, what we see is sort of the power generated when they undergo reactions and decays. So indirectly, in X-ray bursts, we see it all the time. In supernova, um, we see it all the time. In kilonova, which is really the beta decay, going to the question, it has only been observed once so far. Yes. We'll go to the red microphone. Yeah, hi, I'm a Mark. Harvey? No, that's okay. It's for okay. the guy in the back. Yeah, Mark Cole. So, question: People talk about an island of stability. Yes. That's maybe up in the one thirties or something. Yes. It might have interesting chemical properties. Can Correct. You comment a little bit about that. And yes. So um, these are predictions by theorists that say um, there are new magic numbers for the super heavy elements, and then there is an island of stability where these. Um, super heavy elements could live for minutes or hours or whatever time, and then one can start to do real chemistry. Yes, that's correct. And there are other predictions you said that the chemistry changes. 
absolutely in um, super heavy elements. There are so many electrons, they have to be treated relativistically. And so shell structure is a whole different story in this very relativistic regime. And um, a colleague of mine at MSU made the prediction that actually this will destroy shell structure. And so he doesn't believe in that island of stability and that these effects of having so many electrons destroys the concept of a shell structure. So for me as experimenter, that means it's just people like me are needed and we need to either find it or not find it. Um, but there are competing predictions out there as to new magic numbers and an island of stability exists or it doesn't exist. Is EFRIB uh, energetically able to access some of these areas where this island might occur? Um, so since our production mechanism is we take as heaviest nucleus uranium and we smash it into pieces, that is not our research. And this we concede to Berkeley, who can run for many months and maybe years stable beams of titanium and shoot it on a very radioactive target to make the fusion reactions that produce these super heavy elements. So our facility didn't have the purpose or was not designed to do that, but we have facilities in the US and in Russia and in Germany that actually do that, yes. We have one more question from Justin. Justin says, can you speak about any major challenges in scaling computational models to simulate the behavior of rare isotopes at large scale events, like a neutron star merger? Yeah, so in general, and I didn't say that, and I should have said that, um, the nucleus is an absolutely difficult quantum mechanical many body system. You have for LED 208, you have to describe um, the interactions of 208 nucleons. They all interact with a strong force that gets repulsive at very short distances. A little bit further, it gets very attractive and it's a computational tour de force to calculate the properties of any heavy nucleus above, I would say, nickel and um, for sure um, tin region. All of this is computationally extremely complicated and everything uses super com computers now. So for neutron star mergers, that is a whole different story. Um, these are really two macroscopic systems that collide and they, they have nuclear physics ingredients. They use densities and viscosities that we, have, that we only speculate about. Um, and so these codes are very different from what describes nuclei, um, but they use nuclear input and they are absolutely computationally intensive and they use the super com computers, yes. And these efforts are going on and they're very attractive for students who really like computation, yeah. Yeah, as an add-on to that question, to what extent will quantum computing facilitate the ability to uh, do mathematical modeling of the nucleus, if any? Yes, so um, some of my nuclear theory colleagues, maybe they got bored with the shell model, they went into quantum computing. Um, and the, there is one scattering problem, I don't know if it was deuterons, one very simple scattering problem that was computed on a quantum computer and it was shown that it is a little faster or competes with a conventional computer. Um, to calculate the shell model on a quantum computer, I think that is a hundred years later for the lecture. Maybe. I meant from a theoretical standpoint. Yes, Does from a quantum computing have a, an advantage than uh, standard uh, digital computing we use today because of its massive parallelism or it's just completely different problems. Um, I don't think it's a completely different problem. To me, it seems like at the moment quantum computers, um, their architecture is geared towards attacking a specific problem. Um, and there are efforts going on by theorists in conjunction with experimentalists to um, calculate light nuclei and their interaction on quantum computers. So this is going on. There are theoretical efforts uh, and, and, and they are serious, but to attack the many-body problem, I think that we have to wait for. But a part of the field is engaged in this, absolutely. Blue microphone. Uh, my name is Al Ehrlich, and I am a member. Um, I realize that every element is different, yeah. and that the work being done now is for scientific research and not for 
general applications, but what kind of costs are we talking about to produce enough of something, any any element, for example, the cancer treating yes. one, um, per, per person or per, per whatever? Yeah, I, I don't know those numbers, but I can tell you it's so important that the Department of Energy has, has founded an office that just deals with isotopes and with the production of isotopes for the nation. Um, and they do have a significant budget and they support Oak Ridge in producing isotopes and they sell isotopes and they are supporting uh, research that establishes new methods to produce this actinium-225. And, and so they sponsor this on the, on the small scale and then companies take over and they... So this uh, company I mentioned in Wisconsin, North Star, um, they used a method developed by basic research by fundamental research, how to produce actinium-225, and they found investors, and they bought cyclotrons, electron cyclotrons, and they generate Bremsstrahlung, and they um, use that to make out of radium actinium. And so um, fundamental research absolutely lies the seeds um, for these applications that then go commercial. Um, in terms of the money, I don't have that knowledge because that office is not funding me. It's funding some of my colleagues that are in the chemistry department. Um, but these efforts are going on because the promise is enormous. If you looked at this picture, yeah. Blue microphone. Hi, Hi Brett Magram. Uh, I actually have two questions. Um, first one is kind of about, uh, I think it's business 209 it was believed to be stable, but now they think has a half-life of like 10 to the 15 years. Oh yeah. So I guess we're talking I don't have the patience to measure that. <laughs> so, you know, you're talking about all these rare isotopes, but my yeah. question is kind of the inverse of that is, is there any mathematical model which determines why certain isotopes are stable and when you cross that certain line or threshold that an isotope would become unstable from a yes. theoretical point of view? Yeah. So this is not... I wouldn't call it mathematical problem or model. I would, you know, go with Frederica, who would who would call it a nuclear model um, that um, models the binding energies of the protons and neutrons. So, if we were to understand completely the nuclear force, we could predict exactly what combinations of protons and neutrons can make a bound system. Um, but we don't quite know this, and we don't quite know what happens when we keep on adding much more neutrons and we get this imbalance um, between protons and neutrons. And so, yeah, these models exist and any, almost any data point we have can be used to benchmark that model so that they can extrapolate a little bit further. But that is absolutely ongoing research and um, modeling the stability or existence is sort of the most fundamental um, observable a model can, can look at. You know, if we produce calcium 60 and the model tells me it doesn't exist, I don't look any further. Don't tell that to my theory colleagues. But um, so those are very fundamental benchmarks and that's absolutely going on, yes. And then my, I have a second question. It was um, on one of your slides, you showed, I believe, all the elements in the solar system yes. in order. And I kind of noticed that, I think it was beryllium, if I remember right, seemed to be very tiny compared to all the other elements that were on. If you could bring up that slide one more time, maybe it'd be, I think it was beryllium. I was just curious, why was there such a lack of beryllium compared to all the other early elements in the solar system? This one? Yeah, yeah lithium is, is also very small. And I think um, they, are, they were largely used up in the Big Bang and then they are not necessarily produced in stellar burning. Stellar burning sort of goes through um, from, from um, hydrogen through helium and then through carbon and oxygen, and it sort of jumps over beryllium, and beryllium only has one stable isotope, and that's beryllium-9. The others all have, have more stable isotopes. So then, you know, if, if you have many unstable isotopes, they, they will not be found in, in, in the universe anymore. Um, yeah, and lithium is quite famous, and um, this is what is called the lithium problem in cosmology, and it's active research why lithium has the abundance that it has. Um, 
and lithium um, is one of the Big Bang um, produced elements. And, and so this is active research, yes. I think we'll uh, close questions at this time. And uh, before you go, we have a few gifts for you. Gifts for me? Gifts like for that. you, yes. A framed copy of the announcement of your talk. Uh, rosette emblazoned on its side with uh, three bars evoking the symbol for inductance, uh, which is a name for Joseph Henry, our founder, and a copy of volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, uh, covering the period from its formation for a few years thereafter, in which you'll find a list of who founded the organization, why they founded it, a nice discussion about discourse on scientific subjects, and interesting articles, uh, minutes of the meetings and what was presented, including the calculation of pi to 30 places and some other things. Well, you know, today we do it to 30 million places, but eh, progress, right? It is still ambitious, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. And before you go, we have a few closing announcements. Our next uh, lecture will be on November 1st. The speaker will be Jason Eckberg. Jason is a colonel in the US Air Force and spent time in Eastern Europe studying technological changes and the conflicts that are being fought there. He will be speaking on how recently developed technologies like bots and drones are affecting the battlefield and the title of his talk is Ukraine Conflict. On crude, ubiquitous, unprecedented technology applied to war. The 2,505th meeting will be on November 22. The speaker will be Jun Yi. Jun is a JLA and UCB fellow and a professor of physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's one of Catherine Gebbie's recruits to NIST, where he has been working on clocks and timekeeping. He'll be speaking on recent results developing the most accurate clock ever based on nuclear rather than atomic vibrations, and it's promised to open up new experimental studies of basic physics and to develop new, more accurate technologies for communication and navigation, among others. 2,506 meeting will be on December 6th. The speaker will be Joanne Hewitt. Joanne is director of the Brookhaven National Laboratory and chair of the Particle Physics Decadal Survey. She will be speaking on the state and priorities for the future of U.S. particle physics, and in particular, she'll be talking about accelerators. 2,507th meeting, ending the fall series, will be on December 20th. And uh, I will tell you who that speaker will be shortly. Not in the slide, but worth mentioning. On February 7th, Nick Lane, professor of evolutionary biology at University College London, will be coming from London to speak on his theories of the origin of life, which involve metabolic processes and energy utilization and anti-entropic processes. We are in the early stages of planning an all-day mini-conference on the James Webb Space Telescope and its results to be held on Saturday, February 22nd. And that will run with an afternoon session and then the usual reception and dinner and then an evening session and then Joanne Drucker, professor in the Department of Information Sciences at UCLA, will be speaking about the origin and development of alphabets on March 7th. Other meetings are being scheduled and will be posted to the website, so check there frequently for updates. Join me in thanking the people who helped make tonight's program. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn the 2,503rd meeting. Is there a second? All members in favor? All members opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the social hour. <laughs>